Welcome to the Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. Here are this week's top headlines in the crypto news. Terror Tragedy Cryptocurrency's largest algorithmic stablecoin enters a death spiral, causing the crypto market to crumble. What the hell happened? Bear market begins. Coins and tokens see double-digit drawdowns, marking the first lower low for many in more than a year. How low can we go? ETFs down under. Australia approves its first two crypto ETFs as the SEC examines pending ETF applications in the United States. Could this cause a crypto market reversal? Cash for crypto companies. Flow, KuCoin and Chainalysis collectively raise over $1 billion to expand their operations. Here's why that's important. Twitter turmoil. Tesla CEO Elon Musk puts his acquisition of Twitter on hold after questions arise about Twitter's true user count. Is the dead internet theory true? And a closer look at last week's top performing cryptos and where they're headed next. All this and more in just a moment. Good morning, afternoon or evening. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Guy and what you're about to see is educational content, not financial advice. You can find any topics you're looking for using the timestamps in the video timeline. And now for today's top stories. Last week, the crypto market experienced what can only be described as the blackest of black swan events to date. This was the total collapse of Terra, which saw over $40 billion lost in a matter of days. Those who held Terra's Luna or UST stablecoin effectively saw those holdings reduced to zero. For anyone watching who was affected in such a way, I have two things to say. First and foremost, money can always be made back. No matter how bad your financial situation might be, so long as you're alive, the situation can be resolved. Consider for a second the fact that you're even alive to begin with is proof that you come from a long line of fighters. You have it in you to overcome this obstacle just like your ancestors overcame theirs. The second thing I want to say is that if the terror situation has taken your mind to a dark place, please consider reaching out to those who can offer support. I've left a few links in the description if needed. So, what the hell happened? Well, the short answer is nobody really knows for sure, at least not yet. The situation is evolving. Information is still coming out and Terra tweeted that it will be releasing a detailed post-mortem in the near future. As for the long answer, I'll be doing an in-depth video about Terra's collapse later this week once more information has come out, but I'll give you the Cliff Notes version based on the information we have now. So to fully understand what happened, you need to be familiar with Terra's mint and burn mechanism for stablecoins, specifically UST, a decentralized stablecoin that was once pegged to the US dollar. Don't worry, I'll keep it simple. So, minting one UST required burning one dollar's worth of Luna and vice versa. So if you had one Luna and Luna was worth ten dollars, you could burn it to mint ten UST. Conversely, if you had ten UST, you could burn it to mint one Luna, again assuming Luna was trading at $10. If UST was trading at, say, $1.50, this created the incentive for Luna holders to burn their coins to mint UST and instantly make a 50% profit for selling UST for, say, another stablecoin. This increased UST's circulating supply, and the sell pressure restored UST's $1 peg. The same process worked in reverse. Now, when the crypto markets were going up, Terra's mint and burn mechanism worked quite well because Luna's price was going up with the rest of the crypto market, along with the demand for stablecoins such as UST. In Terra's case, most of the demand for UST was coming from Anchor Protocol, which I won't get into here. Now, when the crypto markets dipped, Terra's mint and burn mechanism didn't work so well. This is because Luna's price started to go down along with the demand for stablecoins. As a result of the mint and burn mechanism I just mentioned, a reduction in the demand for stablecoins meant UST dropped below its $1 peg as people sold it off for actual fiat to cash out. 
With UST below its peg, many UST holders began to burn their UST to mint Luna since they would get $1 worth of Luna in exchange. Logically, they had to sell that Luna for something else right away to actually get their dollar when Luna was crashing, and this caused Luna to crash even more. The end result was something called a death spiral, which has been the unfortunate fate of many algorithmic stablecoins, and this is basically what happened to Terra. To try and prevent this death spiral, a non-profit that coordinates Terra's development, called the Luna Foundation Guard, had been accumulating billions of dollars of BTC, which could be exchanged for UST in the event of a market meltdown. This would take the sell pressure off Luna and supposedly stop a death spiral from ensuing. The only problem was that the Luna Foundation Guard was forced to sell its billions of BTC to protect UST almost as soon as it had finished accumulating, because UST started losing its peg faster than anticipated, supposedly because of a whale who was dumping UST on exchanges. With the BTC backstop gone, Luna started crashing as UST holders began burning billions of UST to mint Luna, and the rest is history. Again, I'll be doing an in-depth video about what went down in a few days, as there are many, many more layers to this sorry story. Now, as many of you will know, I wasn't quite convinced that we were in a bear market just yet. This is because BTC's price had been consistently setting higher lows since last May, as had many altcoins. Well, it's safe to say that the bear market is beginning to set in now, because BTC set a new lower low of under 27 k a price that we haven't seen since late 2020. The key word here is beginning, because we've seen BTC suddenly reverse out of lower lows before, most notably last May. If this trend of lower lows continues, however, then we will officially be in a bear market, and I know many of you would argue we're in one already. This is understandable given all the factors that are weighing down the crypto market, and the first is obviously Terra's implosion. Terra's Luna Foundation Guard sold $3 billion of BTC in its attempt to protect UST. And though most of this BTC was probably sold over the counter, I suspect some or even most of it was sold on the open market for UST. Whether this sell pressure had any meaningful impact on BTC's price likewise remains to be seen, but it's arguably irrelevant given that BTC was being dragged down by a series of other, more significant factors. One of these was BTC liquidations, which were likewise in the billions. Another significant factor was the temporary depegging of Tether's USDT stablecoin, which dropped to 95 cents. Now, this was a seriously bad sign because most cryptos trade against USDT. Nobody knows exactly why USDT temporarily lost its peg, but one theory is that it had to do with concerns about the regulatory scrutiny of stablecoins following the collapse of Terra. If you've watched my video about the assets backing stablecoins, you'll know that Tether hasn't exactly been completely transparent about the reserves backing USDT, hence the possible regulatory concerns. Meanwhile, the stock market was taking a nasty tumble in anticipation of the release of April's inflation figures for the United States, which came out on Wednesday. For those who don't know, BTC has recently been highly correlated with the stock market. The CPI for April came in at 8.3%, which was 0.2% lower than the month before, but 0.2% higher than what the markets had been pricing in. This caused both the stock market and the crypto market to continue their declines. If you're wondering why, it's because high inflation means the Federal Reserve is likely to continue raising interest rates more aggressively than it otherwise would. I'll actually be doing a video about the Federal Reserve's recent financial stability report later this week too, so stay tuned for that. As for altcoins, select smart contract cryptocurrencies took the market downturn particularly hard, and this is again because of Terra. Its UST stablecoin was in dozens of DeFi protocols, and Terra's own Anchor protocol had recently expanded to Avalanche. Not only that, but Terraform Labs and Terra's Luna Foundation Guard had collectively purchased $200 million in AVAX in early April, leading to fears that AVAX would be liquidated to protect UST's peg, and it looks like some selling did in fact take place. 
In terms of how long this downturn could last, it's really anyone's guess. But if previous bear markets are anything to go by, we might not see the bull market come back until Bitcoin's next halving in late 2024. In terms of how low we could go, many believe that BTC could fall as low as 20k, given that this was the high of the previous bull market, and BTC has never dropped significantly below its previous bull market top during bear markets. Note that the downturn will be twice as bad for most altcoins. Doing your own research is going to be more vital than ever in the coming weeks and months, and luckily, we have plenty of videos that can help you with that. Anyways, despite all the crypto market carnage, there have actually been a few bullish developments that seem to have fallen off the radar. And one of these was one of Australia's stock exchanges finally listing three cryptocurrency ETFs. For context, Australia was scheduled to list these three crypto ETFs more than two weeks ago, but the listings were suddenly delayed because of an issue with an unspecified service provider behind the scenes. Now, if you've watched any of my videos about crypto ETFs, you'll know that spot ETFs are especially important because they provide direct exposure to the asset in question. In other words, the ETF issuer must go and actually buy and sell physical BTC or ETH in response to the demand for their ETF. As you might have guessed, all three of Australia's cryptocurrency ETFs are physically backed, with two for BTC and one for ETH. Though each ETF has its own way of achieving a spot status, the end result is the same – direct buying pressure for BTC and ETH. Unfortunately, Australia's cryptocurrency ETFs listed when the crypto market was collapsing, and this is probably why they only saw $1.3 million of trading volume combined. This is significantly below the $1 billion that some experts were projecting. Even so, these three crypto ETFs are significant because they make Australia the second America analogous country to list spot cryptocurrency ETFs, the first being Canada early last year. With Australia and Canada embracing these investment vehicles, it puts even more pressure on regulators in the United States to do the same and approve spot cryptocurrency ETFs in their jurisdiction. The regulator in charge of this is, of course, the SEC, and it currently has a handful of spot Bitcoin ETF applications sitting on its desk. These applications seem to have a solid shot at being approved because they weren't rejected along with others in previous SEC decisions. One of these spot Bitcoin ETF applications comes from Grayscale, which is looking to get approval to convert its $20 billion Bitcoin trust into a spot Bitcoin ETF. Luckily for Grayscale, the SEC seems to be open to approving its ETF application, at least according to a recent meeting between the two parties. The final decision date will be July the 6th, so mark your calendars. Another pending spot Bitcoin ETF application comes from WisdomTree, and the SEC recently opened its doors to comments about this application. I should point out, though, that WisdomTree was rejected by the SEC earlier this year and had to refile. In any case, it appears that progress is being slowly but surely made towards the approval of an American spot Bitcoin ETF, but as Australia's own listing of spot crypto ETFs has shown, they may amount to nothing more than a fart in the wind if they're listed when interest in the crypto market is tanking. In the interim, crypto companies and projects will continue to raise billions because even though crypto prices have been plummeting, the fundamentals have only been improving. For starters, the Dapper Labs crypto project Flow, which announced a whopping $725 million ecosystem fund featuring some of the most prolific VCs in the crypto industry. Oddly enough, Flow CEO Roham Garagoslu specified on Twitter that most of this money will go towards investing in other crypto projects rather than incentivizing developers to build on Flow. It's not entirely clear where exactly all this capital will flow, pun intended, but given Flow's close relationship to big brand names like the NBA, NFL, and UFC, chances are these investments will involve products for similarly popular brands. Next, there's cryptocurrency exchange KuCoin, which raised $150 million from various crypto VCs to develop DeFi-related products, including a DeFi wallet and DeFi protocols on the KuCoin community chain. 
For those unfamiliar with KuCoin, it's easily one of the best cryptocurrency exchanges for up-and-coming altcoins. And if you're interested in opening an account, you can check out my tutorial and use the link to get a fee discount. You are welcome. Anyhow, last but not least, we have Chainalysis, the infamous blockchain analytics company that's tracking all of your cryptocurrency transactions. Chainalysis recently raised $170 million from a series of institutional investors, and this is actually very good news. That's because Chainalysis is surprisingly pro-crypto, and let's just say that this isn't exactly the case with other blockchain analytics companies out there. Chainalysis's recent funding round gives it the largest war chest of any blockchain analytics company, which is therefore good news. With some luck, this will translate to even more crypto adoption at both the individual and institutional level, never mind the regulatory guidance that comes from objective on-chain analysis. You can find out what Chainalysis said in the recent crypto crime report by watching my video about that using the link in the description. Anywho, another crypto-related company that's been making the headlines lately is Twitter, and that's because Elon Musk is currently in the process of acquiring it for $44 billion. This is relevant to crypto because Elon has already hinted on many occasions that he plans on integrating more crypto elements with the social media platform. There's even been speculation that Elon aspires to combine crypto and Twitter with Starlink for interplanetary payments and communication, which, let's admit it, would be pretty awesome. By the way, US politicians will be holding a hearing about UFOs for the first time in 50 years this Wednesday, and I'll leave a link to the live stream in the description. I digress. Now, as amazing as all these ideas sound, at the moment, the focus is on Elon's actual acquisition of Twitter, which seems to have hit a snag after he started to question Twitter's claim that only 5% of its users are spam or fake accounts. If you're a fan of crypto and have been on Twitter for more than 10 seconds, you've probably encountered your fair share of spammers and fake accounts already, especially if you've dared to criticize any crypto project with a militant community. It seems that Elon intends on solving this issue by making it possible for real users to verify their identities via KYC, or even just by providing a deposit of some collateral, be it fiat or crypto, to create an account. Creating a cost for spammers and fake accounts would, theoretically, reduce their presence. Naturally, Elon wants to make sure that Twitter's user base is actually real before pouring tens of billions of dollars into the company. And the fact that Elon doubts Twitter's 5% fake accounts figure suggests that he thinks this figure is much higher. Now, this ties into something called the dead internet theory, which posits that most of the interactions you have online are not genuine, meaning they involve bots and fake accounts, and that most of the content you see on the internet was generated by AI and the like. Now, while the second part arguably borders on conspiracy theory, even mainstream media outlets have come out in recent years to ask whether the dead internet theory holds some water, specifically because of all the abnormal interactions on Twitter and other social media platforms. I suppose it's quite comforting to think that quite possibly most of the unpleasant types out there in cyberspace aren't actual humans after all. Perhaps there's hope for our species yet. Turning to the charts, we can see that BTC is sitting at around 30k, which is admittedly below the support levels I suspected we could fall to last week. As scary as this looks, I'll remind you that this marks the seventh straight week of red for BTC, and I think it's been something like a decade since BTC has seen this long of a decline. I really want to say that a recovery rally is imminent, but I must confess that what I'm currently seeing looks more like a bear flag that could take BTC to the low 20Ks. Alternatively, we could see a small relief rally to the upside to around 33 or 34K, where BTC is likely to experience lots of resistance. Last week's top performing cryptocurrencies were MakerDAO, the decentralized Fay stablecoin, the centralized TrueUSD stablecoin, the decentralized DAI stablecoin, and the centralized USDC stablecoin. Talk about clutching at straws. Starting with MakerDAO, the Maker token went on a tear after Terra collapsed, and this is simply because believers in decentralized stablecoins move their money into the next best thing, which is MakerDAO. 
Not surprisingly, Maker's recent rally announced nothing more than a blip on its long-term price charts. Note that DeFi tokens of all kinds have been lagging behind the rest of the crypto market over the last year, which is quite unfortunate. Next up, we have the Fay stablecoin, which, I mean, is a stablecoin, so it didn't really pump per se. As I just mentioned, Fay is a decentralized stablecoin, and it seems it received some of Terra's mercenary capital as well. It's the same story with TrueUSD, DAI, and USDC, and I will note that it's interesting to see 50-50 representation of decentralized and centralized stablecoins on this list, even though it's somewhat arbitrary. It's even more interesting to see which decentralized stablecoins have maintained their peg despite the recent dip. The one that caught my eye the most was Magic Internet Money, because many Abracadabra users were using interest-bearing UST from Anchor Protocol as collateral to mint MIM. This just goes to show that decentralized stablecoins aren't all bad, and they're definitely needed because decentralization isn't just important at the blockchain layer. More about that in an upcoming video. And that is all for today's Coin Bureau Weekly Crypto Review. If you enjoyed it, you know what to do. Hit that like button, subscribe button, and bell icon too. Note that there's only two weeks left to try your luck at winning one of 10 prizes of 0.1 BTC. That's more than three grand, which is still a pretty penny despite the recent market travails. Additional details can be found in the description just below me. Thank you so much for watching, folks, and I'll see you all in next week's episode.